to be dismissed from Children's Church. Last Sunday we began looking at Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33, and there's just, there's just so much for us here that we're taking two weeks to cover this passage. So we'll um, think about what God wants to teach us about marriage once again this, this Sunday morning. So I'm going to read Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. The Apostle Paul writes to us, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray together once more. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're thankful that your word teaches us about all the important things in life, including marriage. Lord, we're, we're just so grateful that we're not left to figure it out on our own, about how we should live in our marriages, but that you've told us in your word how marriage works best and how we can honor you in our marriages. And so, Father, as we look into this passage this morning, I pray that First of all, that you would give us open hearts to hear what your word has to say to us, Lord. Father, would you help us by your spirit to be, respect, to be receptive to how you would want to speak to each one of us here today. And Father, I pray that you would use, this, use your word this morning to strengthen every marriage here, represented here today, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would use your word to restore marriages that need restoration, to rescue marriages that need to be rescued. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would use your word to bring encouragement to husbands and wives, and to bring conviction, and to bring repentance where it's needed. And so, Lord, give us open hearts now to hear what you would have to say to us. We're thankful, Lord, that you've given us this, this precious gift of marriage, and so may we honor you in it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Before we get into the text this morning, I just want to remind you of where we are at here in the book of Ephesians, remind you of the context. Here in the second half of the book, Paul is teaching us how to live as people who have been made new by the grace of God. If you belong to Christ, then your sin is forgiven, you are a new creation, and therefore you're called to put off the old self and to put on the new. And if we're going to live as new creations in Christ, then according to chapter 5, verse 18, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw in verses 18 through 21 that when we're filled with the Spirit, He helps us to sing praise to God, He helps us to be thankful, and the Spirit of God helps us to submit to one another within the proper relationships. Now at the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, Paul is teaching us what this kind of submission involves in our marriages, and in parent-child relationships, and in relationships between masters and slaves, or in our context, employers and employees. I think you could say that the end of Ephesians 5 and the beginning of Ephesians 6 are teaching us about what it means to live a spirit-filled life in our marriages, in our homes, and in the workplace. And so with that in mind, we're going to zero in now on marriage this morning. Last Sunday we focused on really one main thing, and that is the truth that marriage is a picture of the union between Jesus Christ and the church. This is why this text is applicable to everybody here this morning. If you're not married right now, but if you know Christ as your Savior, then you are a member of the Bride of Christ. And the Bride of Christ, of course, is joined to Jesus in that one flesh 
union. And so it says in verses 31 and, 30, and 32, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is, of course, is a quote from Genesis 2. And then Paul says in verse 32, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This is the foundation for everything that Paul is teaching about marriage in this passage. Your marriage is designed to be a living picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And so last week we saw in verses 25 through 30 that Christ has just an unfathomable love for his church. He gave himself up on the cross to die for our sins. He set us apart to be his own. He cleansed us from the filth of our sin. And one day Jesus is going to present us to himself as a pure and holy and glorious bride. And every day Jesus nourishes us so that we can live, so we can thrive, so that we can grow to maturity as believers. Every day he cares for us. He cherishes us as his precious treasure. Oh, how deeply Jesus loves his bride and he just treasures us so richly. And so we as the church, as the bride, are called to respond to the love of our Savior by joyfully submitting to him. And now, this morning, we're going to see that this relationship between Christ and the church is intended to provide the pattern for our own marriages. And so every husband is intended to play the role of Christ by loving his wife sacrificially. Every wife is meant to play the role of the church by submitting to her husband. And it's important for us to see, before we go any further, that, that the roles of the husband and wife here are not based on any traditions or any standards in Paul's culture. In other words, we can't say, well, in the first century, you know, everybody in the ancient world uh, had a marriage where the man was the head and the wife submitted to him, and that was just part of their culture back in the ancient world. But today, of course, things are very different. And so what Paul says here about headship and submission just doesn't apply in the 21st century. The problem with that is that Paul's instructions are not based on the standards of culture which change. You notice he, does, he doesn't, doesn't say here, you know, in, in all, all the pagan Gentiles have a marriage where the wife submits to the husband. No, what does he base his instructions on? He bases his instructions on God's plan in creation, back in the book of Genesis, and then God's work in redemption, what Christ has done to save us and that relationship that's been established between Christ and the church. And so the foundation for Paul's teaching here doesn't change. Culture changes, but the foundation for marriage and creation and redemption never changes. And so Paul's instructions here are relevant to every culture, to every time, here in the 21st century, what Paul wrote in Ephesians 5 is the way that our marriages should be, period. And because God is the creator of marriage, you know what? Our marriages are going to work best when we follow our creator's design for marriages. If you try to cut your meat with your spoon, it's not going to work very well, is it? The spoon isn't designed to cut meat. If you use your knife to put your food in your mouth, that's not going to work very well either, is it? You might end up in the emergency room. A knife is not designed to function like a spoon. Your silverware functions best when you use it in the way that it's designed to be used. It's, it's this way for everything, right? And if you try to use your hammer to, 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 uh, to, to, to tighten a screw, it's not going to work very well. Or if you try to use your screwdriver to pound nails, that's not going to work well either. It's, it's not designed to function like that. When we follow our Creator's design for marriage, when we, when we seek to, to, to say, okay, Lord, how have you created marriage, and how can we function within your plan? How can a, a, a husband work the way that you've designed the husband to work? How can a, a, a wife function the way that you've designed for her to function? That's when our marriages are going to flourish. That's when they're going to be joyful. And so what does this look like in our marriages? In our ordinary, everyday lives, what does it look like for the wife to play the role of the church and submit to her husband? What does it look like for the husband to love his wife as Christ loves the church? Those are the questions we're going to try to answer today from Ephesians 5. And so we'll start in verse 22. Paul writes there again, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Why is that? Why should wives submit to their husbands? The answer is in verse 23. For, or because... 
The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. The husband is the head, therefore the wife is called to submit to him. That's Paul's reasoning here, that's Paul's logic. And so before we try to define what it means for a wife to submit, and we're going to get there here in a moment, I think, what, I, I think we need to try first to define what it means for the husband to be the head. Let's see if we can get an idea, get a handle on this idea of headship, the husband's headship. And then, once we do that, then we'll try to get a handle on this whole idea of submission. And so headship, you see in verse 23, begins with Christ. Christ is the head of the church, Paul states. Which means that he is the leader of the church. He is the one with the ultimate authority. Colossians 2.10 says that Christ is the head of all rule and authority. Ephesians 1.22 says that God the Father put all things under his feet and gave Christ as head over all things to the church. And so, if Christ is the head of the church, that means very simply that he is our leader, that he has the authority. And what does Jesus do without authority? He doesn't use it to boss us around. He doesn't use his headship to treat us like a bunch of slaves. He uses his authority to serve us. Christ is the head of the church, and as verse 23 says, he's also the savior of the church. I think Paul is pointing out that very, very um, deliberately here because he wants us to know that Christ is the authority, and what kind of authority is he? He's a loving, gracious, saving authority. There's, there's no king like Jesus, is there? <laughs> Jesus knows he's our king. He knows that we are under his authority. And yet, as he said in Mark 10.45, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. And so every husband, as the head of his wife, is called to be a servant leader. I think that's how we can define headship here. The husband's headship in marriage is all about servant leadership. A husband who says, well, I'm the head, and so I'm going to command my wife to do the dishes and take care of the kids while I sit on the couch and watch TV and drink beer, that is not a Christ-like head. A husband who uses his headship as an excuse to abuse his wife is a dysfunctional head, not a Christ-like head. And it's also important to recognize that a husband that's passive and who doesn't take the responsibility to lead his wife, is also not obeying God. If we as, as husbands are going to lead our wives well, then we need to avoid, on the one hand, being tyrannical leaders, being the boss. We also need to avoid, on the other hand, being leaders who don't lead, being leaders that are passive, being leaders who actually abdicate our role as leaders. You know, in any organization that you look at, whether it's the family, or the church, or a business, or a school, if the leaders don't lead, that's not going to help the people they're supposed to be leading, is it? And so brothers, we have a God-given responsibility to lead our families, and good leadership is going to be a huge blessing to our wives and to our children. And so let's think of ourselves, brothers, as servant leaders. That's what we need to aim for. And notice, it's, it's interesting, Paul never says in this text, doesn't say anywhere, husbands, make sure that your wives submit to you. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. He does say, husbands, you're the head of your wife, therefore, love her as Christ loved the church. Verse 25. Now, if that's what's, what headship is all about, then what does it mean for wives to submit to their husbands? Well, let's start with a few things that it does, that it does not mean. Submitting to your husband does not mean that you follow him into sin. <laughs> if there's a conflict between what your husband wants and what the Lord wants, you need to obey Christ. Also, submission does not mean that, that you're a doormat, that you don't think for yourself, that you never provide any input on decisions for the family. You know, if a man loves his wife, he's going to welcome her input on decisions. He's going to even ask for her input. If he's humble, he's going to realize he actually needs her input. <laughs> Our wives are often wiser than we are. They see things that we don't see. Submission also doesn't mean that you never get to correct your husband. If he's not leading the family well, if he's not treating you well, you shouldn't just decide, well, I'm not going to say anything because I'm called to submit. Now, in that situation, the husband needs to be corrected so that he can repent of what he's doing wrong. 
When you love someone, you will correct them when you see them failing to honor God. Now, of course, there's a godly way to correct someone. There's a submissive way to correct your husband. And there is an unly, un ungodly way to correct someone. And so, <clears throat> this is difficult. And, and yet, the, the, the truth is that those of us who are husbands really have a responsibility to make clear to our wives that we can be corrected. That we'll be willing to hear them out. That it's safe for us to con it's safe for them to confront us. And, and we'll listen to them when they, when they need to do that. And so then, if that's what submission does not mean, then what does submission mean? Well, it begins with the heart. Look again at verse 22 with me. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord. Submission is driven by a motivation to honor the Lord. If you're a married woman, then I think you can think about this most of all as, <clears throat> as a way that you can honor Jesus. When you play the role that he's given you, and your life is increasingly becoming a picture of the bride of Christ as the bride submits to, to Christ, you know what's going to happen? Jesus will be glorified in your marriage. He'll be glorified in your life as you submit to your husband. And so submission should not be driven by some kind of an obligation. You know, I, I don't want to do this, but I, but I have to because the Bible says so. It shouldn't be driven by whether or not your husband is worthy of submission because there will be moments when he's not. It should be driven by a heart that says, I love Jesus and I want to honor Jesus and therefore I'm going to submit to my husband as a way to glorify Jesus. Amen. And so with that heart motivation, submission involves a desire, you could say an inclination of the heart to respond to your husband's leadership in a way that follows him and that supports him as he leads the family. Look at verse 24 with me. It says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And so the pattern here is, is the way that the church submits to Christ. We could ask, how does the church submit to Christ? The church recognizes Christ's leadership, and the church affirms and supports and follows his leadership. That's the model for how wives are called to submit to their husbands. It involves recognizing his God-given role and affirming it, encouraging it, and willingly supporting and following his leadership. And then, with that heart motivation to honor the Lord, with that desire and inclination to follow your husband's leadership, submission can be worked out practically in, in probably hundreds of different ways in ordinary life. I'm not going to give you a list. I'm not going to say, okay, here why, here women, here are a couple dozen different ways that you can submit to your husbands. <clears throat> it is probably going to look different for every couple. That's the reality, is that this is going to be worked out in specific ways in every specific marriage. But I think that what Paul is teaching us here is that if your desire as a wife is to honor Christ and to willingly support your husband's leadership, then it will probably be pretty clear in most situations how you can apply this principle in your life. Right. Now, before we move on to the husband's responsibilities, I want to just address one more issue. This call for wives to submit to their husbands is complicated by the fact that all of us that are husbands are far from perfect. You know this about your husband, don't you? <laughs> in fact, you know his imperfections probably better than anyone else in the world. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, if my husband were more loving or more appreciative of me or a better listener or more whatever, then it would be easy to submit to him. But how can I do this when he has so many imperfections? That's a good question. To answer that question, we have to back up in the book of Ephesians. Do you remember what Paul said back in chapter 4? Verse 2 calls us to be patient. It calls us to bear with one another in love. Does your husband never try your patience, ladies? <laughs> of course he does. If you say no, then you might need to um, read the verse that talks about bearing false witness. <laughs> your husband will try your patience. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to give you patience. Verse 26 of chapter 4 says that you shouldn't let the sun go down to your anger. In other words, it's assuming that all of us will get angry at times. 
You may get righteously angry, but you're going to need to work through that anger quickly rather than allowing it to simmer for a time. Verse 32 calls us to love, excuse me, to forgive one another as the Lord, as the Lord has forgiven us. In order for any marriage to thrive, there needs to be a lot of forgiveness given and a lot of forgiveness received. We can look at other verses in this context, but let me sum it up this way. If your husband were perfect, then you could submit to him in your own power. It would be easy. It would be easy for even an unbelieving wife to submit to a perfect husband. But no woman is married to a perfect husband. I know that Carla is certainly not married to a perfect husband. And that's why you need the Holy Spirit to help you to do things that aren't easy. Things like being patient, being <clears throat> bearing with your husband in love, working through your anger quickly, seeking to forgive your husband. And I think that's one reason why it's so important to remember the context here in Ephesians 5. Verse, 5, verse 18 tells us to be filled with the Spirit. And this passage, of course, is describing what a Spirit-filled marriage looks like. And so yes, I'm sure for every wife in the world, it's going to be a challenge to submit to an imperfect husband. But you know what? For all, for all uh, women who are believers, the Holy Spirit is, a, is living in you to help you to do this. The Holy Spirit can help you to treat your husband in a way that an unbelieving woman cannot treat her husband because she doesn't have the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God can help you with this, sisters, so that Christ can be glorified in your marriage. So now we're going to move on to Paul's instructions for husbands. We've already seen that men are called to lead their wives, to lead their families, because of their role as the head. As we saw in verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. This is really important for us men. When I was in college, I, I took a class on small group communication. And I remember we had one assignment where the class was divided into groups of five or six people, and we had to research a topic of our choice and then do a presentation on it. And the point of the assignment was not to learn about that particular topic, really, but the point was to learn about the dynamics of, of how, a, how a small group functions, how a small group communicates. And so after our presentation, the professor asked us a bunch of questions about the, the communication and how the small group worked together. And one of the questions, I think probably the first one was, who is the leader in the group? And we said, ah, uh, well, it was, it was Nate, kind of. He was a leader in, in some ways. And then it was um, this other girl, I can't remember her name. She was sort of the leader, too, in some other things. And we didn't really have one leader. And the professor said to us, a small group needs one leader. <laughs> and we lost a lot of points because we couldn't figure that out. We couldn't figure out who the one leader should be. Brothers, your family has one leader. And you're it. <laughs> the question is not whether or not you're going to lead. The question is, how will you lead? Will you lead well? Will you lead as Christ calls you to lead? Will you lead in a way that's going to be a blessing to your wife and to your children? And so, what does Christ-like leadership in your marriage involve? Let's start with verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is the greatest love that we could possibly imagine, isn't it? Jesus performed the greatest act of love in history when he laid down his life for us on the cross. And so Paul isn't telling us here, husbands, you need, to, um, you need to try to love your wives. He's not saying even, husbands, you need to love your wives a lot. He's telling us, think about Christ. Think about Christ's sacrifice. That is the greatest love that you could ever imagine. Now, brothers, love your wife like that. <laughs> this means that your love for your wife should be costly. This is the very opposite of the way that, that our culture thinks about marriage. In the 21st century in the, United, in the United States, our culture tells us that marriage is the road to self-fulfillment. This is the way to become happy. This is the way to fulfill your desires and, and your dreams. And if your spouse isn't making you happy, then just move on to someone else who will. That's what our culture tells us today. Ephesians 5.25 teaches us, marriage is about dying to yourself. It's not about self-fulfillment. It's about dying to yourself, like Christ died for us. 
Marriage is about setting aside your selfish desires for the good of your wife. It's about serving your wife, not serving yourself. Brothers, do you look at your marriage as a way to be served or as a way to serve? When you're driving home from work, are you thinking, now I get to sit back and relax and be served? Or are you thinking, once I get home, I'm going to look for ways that I can serve my wife and my kids? Brothers, do you need to repent of any self-serving attitudes and invite Jesus to help you to be like him and to love your wife sacrificially? Next, verses 26 and 27 tell us that he gave himself up for us that he might sanctify her, that is, sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Last week we saw that these verses teach us that, that Christ has set apart the church for himself, and that he loves us faithfully, and that he's at work in our lives every day to help us to become more like him. He's helping us to grow in holiness until that day when we'll stand before him perfect, spotless. If we're going to love our wives like that, then that implies that we need to help our wives to grow in holiness. God's goal for your wife is to help her to become like Christ. And he wants to use you, brothers, to help her to become like Jesus. I think this is a huge responsibility that we have. But you know what? It's also really exciting to think about the fact that God has placed you in the life of the woman that you love to be his instrument in helping her to walk with Jesus and to grow in holiness. How do we do this? How do we help our wives to grow to be more like Jesus? This isn't something that we can accomplish by putting in just a little bit of time and a little bit of effort. We need to be intentional about being the spiritual leaders in our homes and persevere in that calling day after day, month after month, year after year. I think a great way to start is simply by praying together and reading scripture together. I'm not saying that you need to spend an hour every day reading the Bible together, but you know, if you can just spend some time together in God's Word, even a few days a week, and pray together with your wife regularly, that's going to be a great step in being the, in being the spiritual leader in your home. Loving your wife like this also means loving her faithfully. Remember that Christ has a unique love for his church. He's going to love us forever. He's never going to give up on us. And Jesus is not unfaithful to his bride. In fact, the Old Testament talks about how the people of Israel were like an unfaithful wife to the Lord. The book of Hosea especially talks about this a lot. But you know what? God was always faithful to the Israelites. And Jesus keeps on loving his bride no matter what. And so brothers, let me ask you, are you faithful to your wife? Are you, making you, are you making sure that your eyes are not going after any other woman? Are you keeping your heart faithful to your wife? But then what about when, you're lo- when your wife is difficult to love? <laughs> what if she doesn't submit to you? What if she doesn't respect you? What if you can list off her imperfections that make her difficult to love? Well, think about the way that Christ loves his bride. We were like a poor, filthy woman. And the king found us, and he loved us, and he transformed us into a beautiful bride for himself. You know, if Christ quit loving his his bride when he saw our our imperfections, would any one of us here have a chance to be saved? We could be done for. Christ loves his bride in spite of the fact that we are so far from him in spite of the fact that we don't submit to him as we should, in spite of the fact that we don't respect Christ in the way that that we ought to. And you know what, brothers? This is the gospel. This, This is the good news of salvation. Christ loved us, and he died for us before we even loved him at all, when we completely rejected him, when we said, I don't want to have anything to do with you, Jesus. And even after he's made us his own, We continue to sin against Him. We continue to dishonor Him, and yet He keeps on loving us. And so if Christ loves us in spite of everything that we've done to make ourselves 
not deserving of his love, then he can give us the strength to keep on loving our wives, even when we see our, their imperfections. He can give us the strength to, to keep on serving them so that they can grow in holiness, so that they can become more and more beautiful, more and more like Christ. Now, Paul is going to go a step further in verses 28 through 30. He says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. I think this is just so very practical. Brothers, we need to ask ourselves, how can I love my wife as I love myself? What can I do to love her as I love my own body? Paul just assumes here that, that we love our own bodies, that we take care of our bodies. And he wants us to have the very same care for our wives as we have for ourselves. And of course, this makes sense because you and your wife are one flesh. Like Jesus said in Mark 10, they are no longer two, but one flesh. When I was in seminary, I, I, I had the opportunity to take a class from a man named Wayne Grudem, who is, um, he was once the, um, professor, the, uh, the head of Bible and theology at the Evangelical Free Church Seminary in Chicago. Now he teaches in Phoenix, Arizona, and he came to, to the seminary where I was and did a, did a one-week intensive class. It was just really a privilege to get to learn from this wise and godly man. And I remember he shared the story of why he and his wife moved from Chicago to Arizona. His wife has a medical condition that makes her always in, in, in a significant amount of pain. But whenever they traveled to Arizona or somewhere else where there was a, a desert climate, she just felt great. It must have had something to do with the climate the, and the humidity and so forth. And so one day, uh, Dr. Gruden was reading Ephesians and verse 28 jumped out at him where it says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And he thought to himself, if my body were always in pain here in the Midwest, but I felt great in Arizona, I would move to Arizona right away. <laughs> and if I'm supposed to love my wife as I love my own body, then we should move to Arizona. So they did. You know what? That's good leadership. That's really good headship. Probably most of us here are not going to have to move to a different state to follow this command to love our wives as our own bodies. But if you're a married man here today, what does it look like for you to love your wife as you love yourself? What does it look like for you to consider her own interests and to consider her needs just as much as your own? Verse 29 points out the fact that this involves nourishing your wife. We can nourish our wives physically and also spiritually. You know, we provide food for our own bodies. We provide clothing and, and shelter and everything else that we need. And so we're called to do that for our wives as well. To care for them, to, to meet their needs. In other words, I think there's a call here implicitly for us as husbands to be the main providers for our families. It doesn't mean that the wife can't have a job, but the main responsibility for providing falls on the husband. We're also called to, to nourish our wives spiritually to make sure that they're getting fed with the Word of God, that they have the opportunity to participate in the life of the body of Christ and to be built up by their fellow believers. Are you intentional, brothers, about helping your wife to get the nourishment that she needs so that she can grow in her walk with Christ? What about cherishing her? What can you do to help your wife to know that she is, that she is your treasure? Our wives should have no question at all that we love them more than anyone else in the world besides Christ. And so what can, you do, what can you do to communicate to your wife that she is number one in your heart after Jesus? This could take some thought. You may need to study your wife and figure out what brings her joy. But it's worth the effort because Christ cherishes us as his bride, as the church. And we have the opportunity to be like Christ as we cherish and treasure and so the Apostle Paul now has addressed wives, he has addressed husbands, he's called us to carry out the, the respective roles that we've been given, so that mar our marriages can be a picture of Christ in the church, and then he finally sums it up in verse 33. Verse 33 says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects 
their husband. This is really what it all comes down to. We've spent two Sundays now looking at this text on marriage, but Paul wants us to know this isn't meant to be complicated. It's not meant to be something that's confusing to us. God's instructions for us on marriage really are straightforward. This doesn't mean that it's easy. Of course, it's going to be challenging to follow God's instructions, but we don't need to be confused. We don't need to memorize a list of a hundred things to do. We just need to, to, to remember these very straightforward instructions. Husbands, we're called to love our wives with the great sacrificial Christ-like love. And wives are, are called to respect their husbands. As we close this morning, I think that we all know that none of us has done this perfectly. There are no perfect husbands except for Jesus. And there are no perfect wives, including the church. <laughs> and so maybe this morning your marriage is going pretty well. Maybe you just have a few things that you need to work on. Or maybe your marriage is on the verge of breakdown. And you're convicted this morning that you haven't loved your wife, or you haven't respected your husband as you should. Or maybe your marriage is, is somewhere in between those two ends of the spectrum. Wherever you're at in your marriage this morning, I want to remind you as we close that Christ loved us, and he gave himself up for us to forgive us of our sins, including, this, including the sins we've committed in our marriages. And so Christ will forgive you for failing to love your wife. Christ will forgive you for failing to respect your husband. Even if your marriage looks like it's hopeless this morning, there is hope because Christ died to forgive you and to forgive your spouse and to redeem you and he can redeem your marriage. I want to say that with all my heart this morning, wherever, wherever you're at, Christ has the power and the grace to redeem and to restore your marriage. And so will you turn to him? Will you turn to him in repentance and ask him to forgive you? Do you need to talk with your spouse maybe this afternoon and ask your spouse for forgiveness? Will you turn to Christ in faith and actually believe that he can help you to grow to become a more loving husband or that he can help you to grow to be a more respectful wife? He'll do that for you. He'll answer that prayer if you come to him in faith with a heart that's surrendered to him. There's hope for there's hope in Christ for our marriages. There's hope for every marriage here because God can transform all of our marriages to be more and more of a living picture of the marriage between Christ and the church. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that there's hope for us in you, Lord. And so, Father, I want to pray for, for every husband and wife here today that you would help us to, to do what your word has called us to do. Help us as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church. I pray that you'd help the wives to submit to and respect their husbands. And Lord, may our marriages be a living parable of the relationship between Christ and the church. Lord, we need your grace to do this so much. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need, to fill our, we need you to fill our hearts with your love so that we can do this. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be committed to our marriages, to be committed to our husbands and wives, and help us to be most of all committed to you so that you would be glorified in us and through us. We pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We stand sing. Hope is my light, my strength.